Welcome once again to the program, How to Control Your Emotions. And I purposely avoided negative emotions because I'm beginning not to like the word negative emotions because all emotions are negative. I'm going back to my original theme because all emotions are of the ape and not of the human. I would have you all be like Mr. Spock in Star Trek, unlike Captain Kirk, who's full of emotion, or he doesn't have half the good judgment of um, the alien from Vulcan. He had more love because he wasn't emotional and he wasn't selfish. Emotions and selfishness go hand in hand. Rich, my cameraman, called me over the weekend. He said, I've got something in drawing me back to Philadelphia. It just came out from Philadelphia. Taking me back to my old situation, my mother and all the rest of it. Something's pulling me back. You've got to talk to me. I said, why don't you just be a man and stop listening to that side of you. Something's pulling you. Something's making me do it. You've, you've got a side to you. You've got a side to you that is like a snake in the grass. Everybody has a conscience you know, a negative conscience, and there's a positive conscience, and it always appeals to your selfishness and your pride, and your, it tells you everything you want to hear until you're hooked. And then, then it has you. And then it can almost make you do it. And then you make the excuse, you know, the devil's making me do it. Well, most of you, all you have to do is be men and stand up against your emotions, but your emotions is what you need to sustain your pride of judgment and your your feeling about yourself. There are even programs on the radio, TV, you're feeling fine. And they they t teach you how to feel good. You know, anything that makes you feel good. Well, lots of things make you feel good aren't good. As a matter of fact, you have to transcend feeling and, and, and you have to transcend the life that comes from feeling. And that's why you all have your bad habits because you, you are listening to your dark side, you're selfish, is not transcending feeling and you're becoming a slave of the feeling and all the things that engender feeling. All emotions, all emotions are negative. There's no such thing as a positive emotion. But I can laugh, I can be happy, but I don't, I don't have emotions like you do. I absolutely do not have emotions like you do. You can't crawl inside my head and see how I think and feel where my happiness has come from. But it's not coming from the things that make me feel. You can't make me feel bad, and you can't make me feel good. Because I'm the same, neutral all the time. I'm happy. Now, I've said that. Are there any questions? I'm willing, since I've got you into a good mood this evening, I'll, I spent a lot of time last week, you know, stealing the, the show. I let someone else talk now. What I don't understand, if, if you don't use... Uh much emotion yourself. Well, why do you, uh, on occasion, really attack people? Well, uh, last week I was in the audience over there, and uh, you accused me of uh, being a wimp, and several other guys on that side of the audience. And, uh, I didn't know. I didn't notice you last week. Yes, you, yes, you. you I, don't, I just barely remembered. I don't remember accusing you of being a wimp. Yeah, we didn't. We, I mean, I saying, I saying. The certain, if I remember correctly, I was talking to the ladies in the audience. Yes, yes, I know. And if my memory serves me correctly, and it very rarely does, I don't have to rely on memory as a rule because I don't lie. But I do remember that. And we were making some jokes. And then that there are certain, that the women in this audience make judgments and they, they have a resentment towards men who are wimps or bullies. And you can pick out the wimps in the audience, the, the men who are not really men, who don't stand up, because it's written all over their face and it, it's shaped, it's etched in the form of their bodies, how they sit. And I, and I we were talking to the lady, you know, I was talking to the lady about how women feel about men, and she was laughing because, you know, I was sort of, I was calling her shots, and I, I was revealing how she felt and how all women feel when they look at men. There's this little resentment and little judgments going on all the time always feeding themselves a daily dose of hostility and judgment about men. And uh, so she broke down and laughed, and we laughed it off, but you apparently took offense, and it's bothered you the whole week. The question, are you a wimp, or are you not a wimp? If you're not a wimp, it shouldn't bother you. Well, I, I'm a little Call bothered. me a wimp. Call me anything you like. Well, uh, Don't call uh, me too late for dinner. I'm a, I'm a little bothered, I'll tell you that. 
But uh, I think it's I think it's unfair. I think I've seen you do it with other people, and I've always thought that uh, well, maybe you had some insight that uh, I couldn't see. But uh, I was I making I was making light of it. it, it mm -hmm. Was anybody here last week? Well, didn't you? Wasn't it kind of funny the things? I thought it was rather humorous, and you took offense to it. Yes. Even some of the wimps, the men, they knew they were wimps. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, and they said, "Yeah, I'm a wimp." I could see them saying to themselves, and it felt a little embarrassed. But I don't know. It's the first time they've. Ever, they've ever sort of had the opportunity to really look at themselves. I did it lightheartedly. I wasn't being rude, and I did, didn't intend any offense. It was rude. Whether no, but I, didn't, I went, I went home and I didn't lose any sleep. Well, I haven't lost any sleep, but... Uh, yes, you did. Uh, <laughs> a few years ago, I would have had to settle this outside. Well, now, why I'm, I, old, you are. I'm old and fat, and, and, you know, hey, you know, we're past that, but uh, but uh, I don't think I, I think you really you should have spoken up last week. You do that. But you should have woke, spoke up last week, and we, it would have been in context. Uh, Shouldn't have waited a whole week. It's just one cotton picking minute. I'm not a wimp. Oh, that's nice. I would have seen that you weren't. But I was on the side of the audience from which you can't speak. Well, all you have to do is when the station break <laughs> came along, you go to the other side of the audience. And <laughs> I mean, there would have been a way to to handle that. I had to How many men in this audience think, so, think of themselves as wimps? Come on now. <laughs> now, if I, if I kind of intimate that you are, I, were, were you offended last week? No, well, Is it true that, you know, we were make, weren't we making light of it? You weren't offended. Maybe you're too wimpy not to just pick up, you know. <laughs> but on, on the other hand, you might have, you know, taken the point and said, yes, you know, maybe this man is right. I can see myself in the mirror and I can see how women look at me. And I can see how I react to the women, the way they look at me, and they put me down with their looks. See? And then that, that's what it does. Isn't that right? Because when you, when you start to, women, you know, in your relationship to women, you stay that wimp because you can't get over the fact that they keep looking down on you that way, and you can feel the, the women bristling with judgment and hostility. You're sensitive to that, aren't you? And it's kept you in, in, the, in that childlike state. Is that, is that right, sir? See, there's a gentleman behind there. Maybe you can give him a microphone because right behind you. Yeah, I know you must have something to say with that. I do because yeah. I've uh, always been self-conscious of being a wimp, and I've always been very hostile because uh, I could feel people seeing that in me, and I've fought the whole world my whole life. But you, but, but you only became, what did you become? Fighting. You didn't, worse. worse. You, it made you worse, didn't it? There's something about being cast into a role that is very difficult to get out because the only other choice is to be a bully. And there's somebody in your life that you hate more than what you are, you know, yes. you know what I mean? Yes. There's somebody who's a bully that you don't really want to be, so you try to be strong by being weak, by being intellectual. You see what I mean? Yes, I do. You are pretty intellectual in yes, your arguments. Yes, unfortunately. You don't fight like a man. <laughs> you don't fight like a man, right? No. <laughs> because there's some, obviously a man in your life, maybe your father, that that Everything was, you say applies to my life. See? And most, except alcohol and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I'm I, glad. You're not, but you're not put out, you haven't been put out at me, have you? No, because I'm grateful that all the, these intellectual thoughts that I've been playing with in my brain were put verbally so that it, it confirms a lot of things I couldn't speak to anybody. So Nobody would tell you. Uh, no. uh, nobody would tell you quite the way I said it, and you're taking that correction rather well. Maybe you need <laughs> to look at the fact that, uh, you know, that you were perhaps unnecessarily bothered. That the, the other gentleman... See, I have respect for a person who admits what he is, whether you're a bully. I mean, it's no better... It is no less an insult to be called a bully and, 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 a, and a redneck, <laughs> you know. You know and, as a wimp, it's not because neither one of them are men. What, what, all men are guilty of one of those two extremes, aren't they? Isn't that what's wrong with what, what makes women so unhappy? Is they can't find a man, they've either got the extreme, you know, swine, uh, wife beater, bully on one hand, or the wimp on the other. She can't find, she marries, a, she marries a bully, and then she can't stand being bullied, so then she marries a wimp and becomes the bully, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> She hates her father for being a bully, so she grows up to be a bully herself. Or she hates her father for being a bully, and so she marries a man that's that's not a bully. That she, but the but the trouble is the bully is in her. See, so you only have a two choice. When you react to a, a man that's a wimp or a man that's a bully, 
If you're the child, in this case we're speaking about the lady, the woman, the female of the species, uh, it, you're imprinted with taking your identity from the person that has tra traumatized you. See, so when a man is a wimp, it's, it's a shock. And it, it's the failing of a man to be a man, whether it's bully or wimp, that imprints the woman with her destiny. And her destiny is, t now, she has a little bit of that father inside her, so she hates her father for being a wimp. So she, what she does, she doesn't, she hates her father for being a wimp, so she marries a man that's strong. But then she turns into a wimp, see? Then she f has the problem of coming back full circle again. Now she has a father, uh, you know, being a wimp, so she marries this man who, she constantly gives in to this man, but she's becoming like the father she hated, see? Wimping, wimping, wimping in because she's got the strong man. She thought the strong man would take, would do, undo what the weak man failed to do, follow, <laughs> or did. And so therefore the next course of action, and, and it seems like we're running between these extremes. And, and you, of course, the same way with your, with your wife, mother, <laughs> it's the same principle. You marry a bully, you marry someone who's too submissive, and, and we've got to find somehow a balance here, and I've got to speak about it, and I, I, I'm sorry if I offend people, but I have no guile in me. I have no intention of offending any person. I just tell it as I see it. It's not personal, so please don't take it personally. Please. I think you have a tendency to be a bully. I really do. You do? Uh, I mean, what I do you, can we take a vote on this? Am I a bully? I've seen you do it a few times. No. Yeah? You think I'm a bully? No, I, I have to, I have to, I know that I'm a, this last, I've been listening to, to you just about a little bit over a year, and I've always emulated people I've admired. Unfortunately, they've always been very powerfully charismatic people who could, don't really help other people. I don't want to come to your defense, but I do feel that you're the only person that, and I've been into to different est and some religious groups. Yes. And I shouldn't get emotional, but I feel you're the only person who, in, over, in a year's time, has been consistent. And you consistently did, a bully? Consistently, <laughs> consistent with your information, and I feel it's everything I've always known. Now, if you can sort of listen to me without being offended, do you see the possibility of you taking correction? Because the, it is the offense, it is the offense that um, prevents me, for instance, if you had your zipper undone, and, and uh, everybody walks around you, doesn't say anything, but stickers, <laughs> stickers, you know. But I come along and I say, you know, and, and you, you get embarrassed, but you resent me for it because I embarrassed you, see. Mm -hmm. But I had no choice but to embarrass you. I mean, it's embarrassing one way or the other, you know what I mean? I could have let you go around and discovered it later on. <laughs> and then I could spare myself, you know, uh, 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 disturbing you. But I think it's only fair to be the one that says, hey, look. And so some people resent it. So if I find that the person resents me being honest, then I don't tell them anymore. And I think your Holy Spirit conscience is the same way. Um, so, but if I see that you take my correction and don't take, see that that's a put down and take it in the spirit that it's given, then, I, then you encourage me to, because correction is what you need from your condition. And only a person who is between the wimp, or the not on the hard place, you know, the two, crazy, the, the weak person and the strong one, I'm in the middle somewhere. And that's the reason why you can take that correction. I can be the father to you, the friend, strong, firm, you know, a little embarrassing, you know, because you, you know, the zipper is open and your faults are, are, are showing. <laughs> you know? I'm here as your friend to Pardon? correct you. And, okay. <laughs> And, uh, but you know what my problem is? Because I do respect, you know, I respect what you're teaching, but I think do believe that you occasionally have a tendency to be a bully. It's possible. And, and sometimes I think it's too I wish, I wish you'd do it, tell me at the time, though, <laughs> and could pick up the phone or do it right in the moment. That way I'll know not a week later. Because, you know, you correct a person, the worst thing you can do is correct a person a week later, a month later. It's in the moment. It's in the moment when you correct a person because there's something that's going through, something's coming down at that moment. There's some, some electricity in the ether. You know, if you take, if you're a farmer and you don't, you, you can see a farm that's well taken care of because in the right moment, the farmer puts the, the, the waters, the, waters his orange trees or his apple tree. In the right moment, the, he puts the fertilizer down. 
So it's, it, obviously the timing is there, but you take a man who has not got his timing right, you see the t trees are stunted. Now I think something comes across in the moment, and many of us make the mistake of not being outspoken right at that moment. We lack the courage. See? And then, you t then you've, this resentment festers inside there, and it comes out later on angry or too kind of, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but. And then I don't know what, no one knows what you're talking about. The moment's passed. The orange tree should have been watered at the time. I think it's a lack of love on your part to save it for a whole week. You had two and a half hours last week. You should have stood up. You should have found a way. Say, just a minute, don't you think that's too hard? And I had it out with you. And, um, and then you'd find out if I was a bully or not. But I, I'm letting you speak. I think you're wrong, <laughs> but you have a right to say it. And I wish you would have told me at the time because I would have more likely have noted it if it was true. It's the same true with our conscience. I used to tell my wife for years. I would say to her, now look, um, such and such and such and such, you, you know, you're doing something wrong here. She says, okay, I'll think about it. I said, okay. And so I'll ask her a week later, she's still thinking about it. <laughs> so I said, well, this is a delaying action because the correction comes in the moment. Not, in other words, if I tell you something about yourself that is um, embarrassing but true, and it always is embarrassing when it's true, always, very rarely is it any other way. It's a shock. Nobody's going to say anything to you because they're looking for your friendship, looking for advantage. You won't like me if, if I tell you the truth because we're all seeking lies. That's what we are seeking for in our relationship with others. Even when you get married, you marry a liar. You think you're in love. But uh, it's always embarrassing when it's true. And it's always painful for someone who loves you to say, but the only people who c can tell you are those who love you. And they don't care. They risk their relationship with you because they don't want anything from you. They want just you to be a better person. So, they, so there's any opportunity they might have some advantage from you, they forego that and speak up. And it's hurtful, it is painful. But if you receive it, if you don't receive it well, you become the enemy. If you receive it well, you become, you, you really become, you know what friendship is all about. You really know what it is all about. I hope but, you'll be a better person now that I've brought this to your <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> but you may be wrong. See, that's the thing is, I'm saying, because a lot of people always correct me when I'm wrong. Whenever I say, now why doesn't somebody call me up and correct me, because nobody ever does. Then all of a sudden the telephones ring, and everybody wants to correct me, but they got these cockamamie ideas of what, I, what they think I mean and my attitudes. I mean, it, people are always correcting you when you're wrong, when you're right. They want to straighten you out when you're right because they can't stand the pain of, of your innocence, straightforwardness. They can't stand it. So the instant reaction is to put, set you straight. That's why he, how you got confused as a child, by the way. You all grew up confused as a child because you could see your parents for what they were. And it was always setting you straight about how you saw them, right? <laughs> I don't get no respect, you know, but <laughs> they don't deserve any respect. This business about correcting a person and, be, and taking correction is instantaneous. The correction does not take unless it is done right in that second. In my meditation cassettes, most of you have them, I say, well, you know, I can't remember the exact words, I haven't listened to my own junk for a long time. <laughs> but I remember in there saying uh, uh, that not two seconds later, when you understand something, uh, you know, understand it right that moment. Realize the truth of it right that moment. Not two seconds later. Because it is always in the moment when someone tells you something about yourself, um, you have to determine quickly whether that's true or not. Somebody could be correcting you when you're right and trying to make it drive you crazy. And after all, if you're a person that wants correction, you'll listen. And sometimes they're very clever, very articulate, very intellectually persuasive so that you can actually think that maybe you are wrong, maybe they are right. And you, since you're a type of person who's willing to take correction, you tend to take the correction which corrects you from being right. And then you end up being confused. No, so it's a 
taking and giving correction is a very, very delicate thing. But I can give you the rules of the road for that if you like. But I just want to stay on one point. Rule of the road is that it is, is the acceptance of it, the recognition of what this person is saying, has to be accepted right as you hear it. Not a fraction of a second. Must go, if it's one fraction of a second afterwards, and you say, oh yes, I think you are right, I was thinking about what you said, it's too late. You, it didn't take, you didn't acknowledge the truth. We're always rejecting the truth in our mind. Whenever the truth comes and makes us feel uncomfortable about ourselves, we drink, we sm there's a strategic drink somewhere, we turn on the stereo, because we're always finding in that moment a way of rejecting the truth, the conscience. Now, a person comes along with an external conscience, he sees that you have somehow not been corrected, somehow avoided facing some reality, otherwise you wouldn't be acting like the jerk that you are. So he says, hey, just a minute, just, you know, you're doing something wrong here. And in that moment is your moment of truth. Do you accept it? Are you gonna, or are you going to fight him? Are you going to argue with him? Are you going to get upset? Or you could just feel the pain and let it, let it sink in. And in that moment, you're saved. Once you start to do that, now there's rules of the road. Does anybody would like to know the rules of the road of how to know whether a correction, suggestion is acceptable or not? Ah, well, all right. Because my, my producer wants me to take questions and I'm here running the show by myself again. Is it all right? Can I, can I, may I please? <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes. Okay. Doesn't seem like a half an hour went by, did it? Well, here's, here's, here it is, very simple. And maybe in the next segment you can ask me some, something more about it. We can continue. The rule of the road is this. If a person, first of all, you're, are you willing to be corrected? Number one, if you're not, forget these rules. They won't work for you. If you are, the first correction I want to give you is learn not to, take, not to be intimidated by people because then you get confused. You won't have your own mind about things. You'll have the, the other person can confuse you about what right and wrong is and you won't be sure of, of what right and wrong is yourself. So his persuasion can become more persuasive because he has shocked you into accepting his mind emotionally, see? Like hypnosis almost. So the first rule of the road is that when someone comes along and tries to correct you or bamboozle you and tries to make you see the light when it isn't, or you, it may be seeing the light when it is. We don't know yet, right? Sometimes your enemies will make you see the light and they can use, you know, they can know your weakness and they can confuse you about the way they correct you. They, you know, they can make you rebel against the correction. You know, you're a jerk. You said you're a wimp a little while ago, but I could have said it in such a way that it could upset you and you would become more of a wimp. The truth can often make you worse if it's if the way it's presented, isn't it? If I said you... but. Yeah, I'm speaking about him, because uh, he's admitted he's a wimp. So, so but if, if, if I present it to you in a different way, like we did last week, you didn't resent being made aware of the fact that you were a wimp, and you accepted the fact that, that you were. That didn't, make, that didn't mark you for the rest of your life. It got you to seeing, facing the truth for the first time in your life, which set, laid the foundation for change, right? right? So you're less of a wimp this week than you were last week. Is that correct? I think so. I know you are. Now, yeah, I, know, I know so. You know, you know so, right? Yes. Okay, so I know I'm right on those points. So here's the rule of the road. Don't be upset with people. That's the first rule. <clears throat> then you'll have done the first thing right. You'll have to listen to your conscience because your conscience says don't be intimidated, don't fall, to, don't get upset, don't hate people. Then you can always listen to me. And if, if you just concentrate on the intimidation, that is to say your own reaction to intimidation, so that you are calm all the way through, not making any judgments about what the person is saying, but listening to him, intimidating you, or being sincere with you pretentiously. You've got all these factors, haven't you? But just watch, feel the little pain, but watch the resentment, make sure it's not there. That will connect you to reality. And I tell you, soon after that second has passed, the realization of what, if that, what if that person's saying will come to you you will know whether he's correct or not. Because you will have stayed close to the truth by not departing from it resentfully. Do you understand that? You won't have got confused. He might have been a perfect hypocrite, 
but you still could have accepted the correction designed to confuse you. Your, even your enemies can, can, can be used to correct you. See? Because they know your weaknesses most of the time. But if you don't resent it, you'll see your weakness and you'll say, aha, I see I'm weak here. And then suddenly you'll become strong. What is really weakness is not admit weakness, to, res to resent seeing your own weakness, to resent others for bringing the weakness out, and then to struggle with your own weakness until you get weaker and weaker and sink into the swamp. No argument there, right? You're a wimp. <laughs> no, you agree, agree, don't you? Thank you very much. I'm just, uh, just joshing you a little bit. Um, this is program 4979, and uh, you can refer to it when you're ordering, 4579, and you can refer to this number when you're ordering cassettes of the video or the audio. The audio program portion of this program is only $6 if you'd like to write in. And um, each uh, two and a half hour segment is $50. It's five programs you'll get for that. Well, tomorrow we'll continue on the subject. And um, I think we've sort of done, a bit, done it in pretty good, haven't we? But we'll continue tomorrow with our next broadcast. And, this subject and continuing to into many others. We we'll hope that you'll join us tomorrow and the rest of the week and have your friends sort of uh, look in and become enlightened. Thanks for listening and join us in our next broadcast. The of human understanding teaches an observation exercise often called meditation, which permits you to become objective toward your problems and allows your heartaches, bad habits, fears, and anxieties to be completely eliminated from your life without effort on your part. Until you have begun to practice this exercise, much of what you see and hear on the following program may be shocking and upsetting to you. But if you will listen calmly and with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you've been searching all of your life. And now from the foundation of human understanding, here is Roy Masters. Welcome once again to the program, How to Control Your Negative Emotions. But as I said, all emotions are negative. Psychiatrists and psychologists, researchers have just discovered God bless their little cotton socks. <laughs> uh, that uh, that, that uh, um, emotional outburst like anger or rage is just as negative and immune depressing to, uh, to your immune system as pleasure. Things that make you happy have a, have a negative effect on you, a destructive, self-destructive, immune depressing effect and sets you up for sickness and depression. You know, we, even in its extremes, it's called manic depressive. High one minute, low the next. Each low leads to a new high because you want to feel good about being bad. And because feeling good about being bad makes you worse. You know, if you were a thief and I said, I loved you the way you were, you wouldn't become a better person. You'd become be a better thief. So everybody has a dark side to them, a sinful side that if you stroke it, it's going to come out and eat you. So you have women who love men, and all of a sudden they marry, love this man, and he either becomes more and more of a wimp because that's what's in him, and uh, more of a more of an animal, a beast because that's what's in her. You know what I mean? Or a thief or a beast to come out and beat her up because she keeps on loving what is angry and violent. Okay. Now, take our first question. Okay. I've when I was younger, and uh, I was always really self-destructive and violent. You can sit back and relax. You don't need to eat the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I was always really self-destructive and violent. And, yes. and I could never, it was never usually towards people, but always myself. You always take the hostility, not always take it out on yourself, but thoughtful people hate themselves. They don't hurt others. They just hurt themselves. Yeah, I never, sometimes I felt like... You, Committing suicide? That, and, but someone would do something mean to me and my first reaction was to start a fight with them or something, but then yes. I wouldn't. I'd, I'd go destroy a trash can or, or kick a gate, you know, whatever it was, right. instead of hurting them. I know, isn't that silly? Yeah. But still, you are a thoughtful person, you know. You see, 
you know that you don't want to hurt people. You know that someone's got your goat, and this goat's bashing a trash can. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you feel even more stupid. Right. You know, I knew a, I knew a person who was very, very... You, I have a feeling you're quite strong. And you're afraid you might hurt someone. Do you ever feel you might go to court because you murdered someone or... I used to see glimpses of that. <laughs> in fact, I had dreams. I had dreams of, of being electrocuted in an electric chair because you beat somebody up into a pole. Dreams of, of strangling people. And stuff How many like people that? had dreams like that? Come on now, come on, come on. Quite a few of you, right? That's why the death penalty is so scary because we kind of identify with a with the killer, you know. I, this is not funny, but just 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 a couple of days ago, um, a tailgater went behind one of those people who slow down purposely when you try to pass them. This time, I used to say to my wife, one of these days, that someone's going to shoot somebody like that. And it's not really funny, but it's, uh, you, you know, you, it brings out that violence. It brings out that hostility that everybody, everybody has it. And sometimes we don't, don't always express it like this man on this freeway. But uh, we do it in other secret ways. We, we sort of want to choke the cat or something like that and mean to tadpoles. You know, <laughs> you know, and that's what it comes out, this hostility, and then we feel silly. And, um, but very often, the hostility, even being mean to tadpoles, bothers us. So we take it out, we hurt ourselves. We are self-destructive. And the rule of thumb is, is that the, in my cassettes, I say it very carefully, that you mustn't, must be very careful that you deal with, you must be careful that you deal with intimidation correctly because then you take on the, the, this violent nature and you also feel very guilty and you also feel that you might hurt someone and I was coming to the point where this very strong person one time came to me and people would walk all over him and he was very strong but yet he was a teddy bear and people would see that he was weak and wouldn't hurt anyone so they'd take advantage of him even more and that would even make him weaker why was he weak? because he had so much hostility that if he'd ever let it out, one of those people, would, they don't know what they were flirting with. See? Yeah, that's exactly they, it. Isn't that exactly right? Yeah. You're strong, aren't you? Yeah. You're not weak. No. You're athletic. Yeah. I could tell that. You've got that healthy little glow about you. <laughs> okay? The thing is, so but then you know that you could just tear that person apart, especially some of those people who torment you the most are wimpy, aren't they? Are they, know, they know they can get women away with even, it. Women even. Yeah, women. <laughs> they always... <laughs> are going at it. You know. But you know why we have trouble in the inner cities? Because we all feel that way. The law, we're more afraid of the law, as much afraid of the law as we are the, the criminal, the mugger on the street. We don't know, we're between a knot and a hard place. If we stand up for ourselves, we're in jail. If we don't stand up for ourselves, we lose our wallet, maybe our life. We just don't know what to do anymore. It's a terrible dilemma to be in like that. So it's, the, I, I, you know, it's, it's, made, it's made psychotic wimps out of the whole society. And it's given strength to the, the muggers on the street. They rule the streets. We can't go out anymore because we are, are suppressing our anger and trying to be nice about it, trying to be civilized. But we have this anger towards, in ourselves, towards, it comes out in our kids who, you know, they, they get it in the neck. You know, you, you, the boss upsets you, you come home, you take it out on the wife, the wife takes it out on the kids, kids take it out on the dog. A dog's healthy because he deals with, that's the dog's, Dogs react to stress like dogs, and then they stay dogs, but we turn into dogs <laughs> when we react to stress, see. So I'm saying to you that um, this rule of thumb is this. And Christ, when he was here, I bring him into the picture every now and then, give him an honorable mention. I thought, I'm not saying Jesus all the time, Jesus, well, you know. <laughs> like the, the preachers do, I can't ram that down, but he was a very wise man, and he has some beautiful things to say. And he said, if you don't forgive others their trespass against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. So you have to forgive others to be forgiven. It's a very basic thing. And forgiveness is rooted in, uh, for, you know, to give before. To prepare yourself to give the gift of not holding the grudge. Because holding the grudge feeds your ego self. You get something out of judging people, don't you? You, you take pride in, in not being as violent or as cruel as, as, as they are. You know what I mean? Like you're better than them and they're pigs and they're wicked, but the, but the nicer you are, the more you suppress your anger, the more they take advantage, and you're actually cultivating these animals to be more like animals, but then you've become addicted to judging.
be looking like the nice person, but encouraging the, the bad person to be bad for your judgment taking. But then pretty soon the judgment's on you. Suddenly you feel judgment on you for judging everybody, and you feel self-hate, self-loathing. Suddenly you feel like you want to destroy yourself. And there's a, you see what I mean? That's the basic leading cause of suicide. Hating parents, hating society. So you, so you turn this hate upon yourself, so if you hurt yourself, you're not hurting anyone else. You pride yourself in that. You see? It's the same in the meditation, too. It's the same thing. The same anger and rage is the same voices in there saying that, you know, cussing at me, telling me, that, what do you think you're doing? You're not going to get away with this. I'm not going to, you know. And, then, and how do you react to the voices in your head? Do I, you resent it? No, usually, if I'm meditating, oh, if I, can, meditating I, can, I can face it then, but if, you're it, not meditating. If, it's, if it's a second after I come out of the meditation, then it gets me. Yes, in other words, inside your head, you, the meditation that you are learning from me is the way to deal with the... See, the voices, there's two places where the, the tormentor lives, outside you and inside you. <coughs> now, you see, well, you, first of all, the, the tormentor is outside. Your mother, your father, it's usually one of those people, your sister, your brother, someone, uh, somebody in your family, no doubt. All of them. Good. <laughs> right on all counts. <laughs> but the point is, you see, they've never been loved and they've never been corrected. It's passed from generation to generation. And it's living through them into you and they're tormenting you to p make a home for it in you. It's just like the alien. You know, the movie The Alien, it, it goes from one to another and eats your substance out and then jumps into the next person. And we intimidate, and we, how it does it is by intimidating you and tempting you to fall from your grace, from that quiet space that you must find within you. That's what I'm trying to teach you, to get back there and not fall from that grace. But the two places it lives is outside, and when, it, when, but when you react to it outside, it gets inside. And when it gets inside, it stays inside you and it hovers inside you like a person, like a spirit, doesn't it? So that, for instance, if you had a father that said, ah, you'll never grow up to be anything, you're just a big fool, you're going to be a, no, a nothing, good for nothing bum, you've heard that all your life. And it could be at a strategic moment when you were just about to do something right. You know, the shock was great. All of a sudden now, you've got this grandmother or father, the spirit in you, and wherever you go, it doesn't talk to you so much, it, there's like a presence in there. So that every time you come to something you could do right, this presence sits there and kind of evokes that kind of feeling, doesn't it? Makes you do it wrong. You know, yeah, you, you know it, things it, that I, I've been able to do really good at times, then all of a sudden something will happen. But, so, when it makes, but it makes you do something wrong, you resent it inside you. Right. And that's why it gets its goodies. It, it is a living thing. You are dealing with an alien. And if this alien uh, lives long enough inside you and, and you, you keep feeding yourself to it like you will when you resent it, like you resent it on the outside, it gets inside. When you get, it's on the inside, you resent it, you're feeding yourself to it in your head. And see, pretty soon it'll grow up to be the full-grown the full swine you hated in your father or your mother, right? <laughs> you become just like one of those people. It grows up in you and it steps out. So you mustn't resent it either place. You must watch your resentments all the time because resentment is your infantile way of dealing with it. Your primitive, non-gracious. Don't, just when you know, I had a man stop me on the street just now. I remember, 60 years old, he comes up to me in the street. I just come out of a little, little health food restaurant. He says, hey man, he says, can I talk to you a little bit? I knew he wants something. I said, you can ask me directions. And he started to get so mean and so ornery. I said, I said, I'm a stranger. You can't ask me anything but in directions. You want something more, you can't have it. And he started, hey, man, why are you so rude? I said, I'm not rude. I told you, you can have any direction you want. He's, and he uses four-letter words. He's going he's to do me in. And I looked at him calmly, straight in the eyes. And, and he, he just, he reacted to my not reacting and walked off sort of cussing under his breath. He couldn't touch me. See? The secret is, is that when the people see that, when people who intimidate you see that you're strong, that you don't fear, it terrifies them. They don't get their energy. 
They get their energy from your terror, from your reaction. And the reaction is resentment. It typifies weakness. It's the weakness they identify as weakness, subject to them. And it encourages them to hurt you more. So now that must, you must handle your troubles now, which are internal. They're both external because the same people on the outside, they're still out there. You can identify them, you know, you know the Barney, whatever, the, the, the fellow that was on television. He was a bigot. What was his name? Um, Archie Bunker. Yeah, Archie Bunker. See, they're out there all, in all types and shapes and sizes. You can always find some in, in a form of a boss or some, some friend. There's always one. You could probably pick someone out in here that could trigger that reaction. You see somebody here? No, I don't. But I mean, if, if it's always like on a job, I, I'm a construction worker. On a job site, I may get along with everybody, you know, and be able to, to control myself around them. But there's always that one person. Who can get your goat. Right. Yeah, but he's, he's like, he knows, he knows it. He, he knows, yeah, that's it. He knows He's just it. like the spirit, you know, you sort of in, draw, you draw him. Right. They, they ferret you out. Because I don't have many people mess with me, you see. I have every, I mean, uh, occasional person try, but I send out at very strong signals. And I want you now to handle it both ways. Like the young man that come up on the street, stood there, I'm his young man. And I'm an, I'm an old man. But I let him know that I'm no, you know, I may not be any spring chicken, but he better watch out for himself. <laughs> Just see. You want something? Come and get it, right? Back away every time. You see that courage, strength, no fear. See? Now you can be a strong person and exhibit fear, and you invited the problem. There's got to be no reaction. And in your head, when it, it starts to starts to make you fail, you know, you know that that presence in you, m making you make mistakes and giving you the same feeling you had when you were when you were criticized and, and disabled a long time ago. Right. You mustn't resent that inside you either. And then it will disappear. It's a living creature. It's I call the not you. Satisfied with that answer? Yeah. Anybody else? I have a question, Roy. Have yeah. you ever met a man that uh, did not stand correcting? And if so, can you give us an example of what that creature would be? Um, no, could, I, could I hear that? I couldn't quite hear yes, that. Yes, I'll repeat it. I said, have you ever met a man or person or man or woman in general that did not stand correcting? And if well, so, I know a woman. All right. My wife. <laughs> that would be a fine example, I'm sure. I'm just trying to get... better, though. Um, I'm just trying to, to, um, to search. Yeah, there's plenty of people that would like to be corrected. Not necessarily not like to be corrected. No, they will not take the correction. Okay. Do you know, 2,000 years ago, they killed the man that tried to correct everybody. You see, because people don't want to be reminded. You know how many uh, telephone calls and how many ugly letters and death threats I get. First, you can't see any harm in what I'm saying. I'm not calling anybody any names. I'm just talking about principles. I say men are wimps and, and, and cowards and women are this way and that way. But if the cat fits way, if you identify the modus operandi that I'm describing, and most people do, some people say, hey, that's me. Hey, I'm glad someone finally said something. You know, I always thought that I was, you know, wrong, but everybody said I was right. So no wonder I was frustrated. I couldn't change. See? So, but some people like to be called because they want to be corrected. They need a father. They need somebody. They've never had anybody in their life to correct them, and they know what's wrong with them needs correcting, but they can't correct themselves, and they haven't got the secret. And all they need is someone to say, tell it like it is in a, in a, in a, in a proper manner, a caring manner. And they love it. They, they love, rise to the occasion of that need, say, thanks. Thank God fine, someone finally said it. But there's a great majority of people who are so wicked, and they're getting away with manipulating and motivating and, and winning through intimidation, and they've done so much harm to their children, and they've got all kinds of love, respect from the doctors, and no, it's, you know, it, you know, it's not your fault. Love is, love is never having to say you're sorry sort of thing. They, they, they've they've got away with being undetected and they've got away with hurting others and manipulating others that, so that, that when a man like me comes on radio and television um, they, they hate to be found out. But you're always get bringing out the dark side in, in people and that's, that's your purpose, I understand. I, I, have to, I have the prosecuting attorney
to the, of the dark side of the person. Granted, but you you never you never divulge or, or allow us to share what what righteous is, and you're always. I don't understand. You're losing me there. You're you're ex always expanding on on what is wrong with us, but never giving us the light to. to no, cure I, I I don't tell you any. I won't teach truth. I say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and here's why it's wrong, and this is where it's going to lead. If you do that, it'll lead to that, and if you do that, it'll lead to that, or that, or that. Take a choice. Which way have you gone? Or oh, I've gone this way. Or then, well, then you, when you get to this point, it goes from here to here, or here to there. Where have you gone? I've gone over here. So what I, I've shown that sin, I've, what I've gone, I've gone up the scale of the piano, and I've started from here, and I said, look, here's where you've, this is where you've departed from the truth. And now you know that you're wrong, and what, what, how, what wrong can lead, what, where sin can lead. I've given you the dynamics of sin, so there's no question in your life that everything is in your, in your life is due to your departure from a basic principle, which is anger and hate. I, I, I always come back to that, right? Pride, that sort of thing. Then it's up to you to say, you know, I've, always, I've never known what was wrong with me. And for the first time in my life, I can see exactly what I've done wrong and where I can, where I can, where, what my first move is to change. See? I'm br trying to bring you right close to where the root of all your problems, explaining cause and effect and effect becoming cause and, and cause and effect and effect becoming cause and so on. And, and you see that I really understand life. It's like I've been reading your mail. But you're not going to hear me tell you a remedy because I will not rob you of discovering it for yourself. See, I will not rob you. I'm not going to say, God is love, and God is light, and Jesus said, you've got to do this and that. <laughs> and you, and, and you, you have, this is how you could be a proper parent. This is how you've got to be, do this. I'm not going to teach you anything. You see, because the, the scripture says, you need not uh, any man teach you anything but the Holy Spirit. What you need is correction. What you need is to be stopped. See? No, you're doing the wrong thing, and here's why, what will happen to you if you do it. And most of you, it's already happened to you. I don't tell you to stop smoking. I say, look, this is why you smoke. And this is the, this is the dynamics of smoking. Where it springs from, resentment, failing in some way, you know, guilt. Whatever it is, I go through it, and you see, I see exactly what I'm doing wrong and where the wrong begins, where it's seeded, and how it blossoms into all these other diseases and social problems and drinking problems and problems with your wife and your children and your finances and your drinking and your drugs. I always lead back to some simple thing. I say, now, let's take... And you see the value of that. Um, I was going to say something else, but... Go ahead, I'll, I may, it'll come to me in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> part of what he was Can you stand up just please a little bit so I can see you? I can't see you. Thank you very much. Part of what he was saying has happened to me. Uh, with me, it came through as uh, over-regimentation. Over-regimentation, yes. So that after you gave all these principles, for a while I just sat home. <laughs> I wouldn't do anything. Yeah. Well, I was over-religious. You mean you took my, my words as... Uh, and you and you and interpreted and interpreted them as by, regimentation by the church. Yes. Yeah. And so I wouldn't go to. Well, I have a daughter, and so she helped me out. I mean, let me see if I understand you. Was it my effect on you that it regimented you, or the church's effect that regimented it you? It was. It was the church, but I interpreted you as the church. Oh, I see. So yes. So I. So she says, "Can I never listen to rock and roll?" I didn't know what to say. Uh, can how do we choose movies? Uh, when did we go to the beach? It got really awful. I know. So then she forced me to start doing things. And so we made some mistakes. And Who's uh, she? Right here. <laughs> oh, your daughter? Yeah. She forced you to be more, less rigid? Yes. She, she said, well, she... we have to do something. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, you understand that I, I, you, don't, you don't hear me saying you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do well, that. Well, I told you, it came from home and church. Yes. And so uh, I wanted I wanted to come to a group like this, and I wanted the group support. That's no good either. Well, I wanted it anyway. Well, some of it was probably because you can't be a m some woman. Of, some of it was pr probably lack of love. So. But you understand, you can't be a man or a woman when you have su a group support. That makes you weak. Without where are you going to be without a support? When you need to face life and you don't have the group with you, where's your strength? You'll fall apart. 
You don't, you, you could become dependent on being shorn up with group support. That's very dangerous. A Christian, as I see a Christian, should be someone who is, stands alone with some in, hidden strength. People not, know not where it comes from. See, am I right? You don't need group support. You're not here in this group to get group support, but to, to understand, perhaps, by someone else's experience, something of your own experience, you see? Uh, but if I may say, I'm yeah. running into a, well, I have run into a problem, but I'm looking at it a little bit. Um, my whole family has turned against me. Well, they can turn against you for good reasons or bad. You could be a Roy bot. Uh, you know, no. preaching Roy and Masters, Roy, he, the, no. you know what Roy says? Roy says this, Roy no, says no, that, Roy says that. No, it's not in that area. It's not in that area. You know, but you, or you, and, and therefore pe people will turn against you because they see you're caught up with me. No, I'll tell you what area is then. What, but you'll be... Um, when I was in the fundamental religion, relig religious group, they made the rules so strict that you had to marry a person in the church. Well, I couldn't find anybody in that church, so I didn't marry nobody. So, um, so now um, I'm middle aged and I never married. Is that right? Uh-uh. So um, they were. Well, maybe I can find you a nice young man. <laughs> <laughs> that's not. Do you have any offers that's here? Not what I'm get, that's not what I'm getting to. It's okay. It's funny. <laughs> well, you have, to come to, you have to come to a point. We only got a few minutes. Okay, I'll I'll hurry up. I'll finish next. Just so you can come but, to the but point. But the, the point being is. When I first started listening to you, I found out that I wasn't ready anyway. You and wasn't ready for what? For marriage? Marriage. Yeah. marriage. Because you're kind of immature and quite, mechanical. Quite immature. Yeah. And now that so you're ready, you can't find anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's... And now that you're ready, no, you don't need anybody. No, <laughs> no, I'll put it in a nutshell. They said, you're 51 years old and you never married, so you're a weirdo. Not necessarily. I know that. And let me say, if I had known what I know now, I wouldn't be 59 years old and I'm married. <laughs> well, thank you. We had a kind of a humorous uh, end to this, but uh, I was trying to say, in the, just got two minutes to close, that uh, about correction, a scientist does not look for what's right about his rocket ship. When he well, the rocket ship won't fly, there's something wrong with the mechanics, the, wrong, the, the chemical formula for the propellants. So he goes about looking for what's wrong. And then when he finds what's wrong, there's something in looking for the truth that's... There's something about looking for the truth, that there's truth in it. So that what you're looking for is the error with this truth. So when you find the nature of the error, you find the truth at the same time. You say, ah, that's wrong. That's right. That's wrong. Right? It's called, aha, now I see what's wrong. But you're seeing both ways. You see the wrong and you see the right at the same time. You see which way not to go and you see which way to go. And I'm going to help you to find out what's wrong so you can say, aha, that's right. I want you to see it for yourself. It isn't yours unless you can see it for yourself. I'm not a grace robber. I let the church tell you what right is and make you dependent on them and they'd be your God. Well, thank you very much. Will you join me tomorrow night or in our next program? Please bring some friends and freak them out. <laughs> <laughs> Have a party. <laughs>
and all of your troubles are due to your emotional state. And uh, we're exploring emotions and how disruptive and hurtful it is. But I know most people think that emotions are good to be angry, good to be excited, happy. And we look for those emotions to stimulate us. But as you will come to see, slowly but surely, give me a chance, I know the statements are rather controversial, you see that all these emotions will kill you in the end. Emotions have arisen, all your emotions have arisen from the failure to love. And you fall from grace, you fall from completeness. And now you have to become emotional in order to get the, the, the energy to function in life. There's a motion of the soul, a life, a natural energy like a ballerina, a graciousness, a strength and a power, that when you lose that, you substitute that with animal feelings. And I hope to make you see all this in due course. Now, we, we, ha we have been talking about um, taking correction. I hope to correct you from being emotional, but, uh, and I don't want you to get upset about it, because then you'll, get my, you'll understand my point more clearly. <laughs> so we have been talking about taking correction, and if we want to continue along that li line of thought, I'd be very happy to deal with it further. But there are some questions. Now, who would like to be first? You choose. Uh, Roy, I have a hell of a time getting up in the morning sometimes, but most of the time, um, whether or not I have to go to work or if if I don't have to go to work, it's just a slow, arduous process becoming conscious <laughs> and, uh, you know... Slow, <laughs> arduous is very descriptive. Uh, unfortunately... I can see. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, it, uh, this problem also seems to manifest in my meditation. And often I will meditate and will become centered only to start to fall asleep, and sometimes completely, and just... Well, it sounds like you're escaping into your sleep. That you're using sleep as a refuge, escape from guilt. Like alcohol as a refuge, an escape. You know, there's something about a bed which is, uh, has a lot of conditioning attached to it. You know, you, you have sex in bed, at least some people do. <laughs> you're conceived in bed. You're born in bed. You get, you know, you sleep in bed. You, you get sick in bed. <laughs> you die in bed. <laughs> bed has some... Bed, bed has a conditioning to it. Should I get rid of my bed? <laughs> get rid of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's a big problem, but when, <laughs> it's a big bed. <laughs> no, see, some people have <laughs> some people have a problem with sex, and some people castrate themselves. I mean, taking it as far as you took it, they have such a problem they think that sex is the problem. So, you know, castration that people who do that to themselves is quite common. Anybody here has done that? <laughs> no. But, but the point is, you see how far the human mind will go to identify the thing itself, which may be it's perfectly natural to sleep and lie down and sleep in bed, and it's perfectly natural to have children. But if that is abused, it becomes an addiction and then a source of guilt. Because everything that is used to, as a refuge is, is uh, everything that is abused, every natural thing that is abused and used to escape into, to support ego, see? To deny truth. Food is natural, but if you use truth to escape, to run, run, to run away from reality, to give you a dreamy feeling that everything's all right when it isn't, 